Well, let's welcome Tom back. And uh, yeah, good stuff. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, uh, Pastor Dave. Okay, so I just want to, now we can have some time for a few questions. Um, quick summary of the steps to get out of debt. These are just general guidelines. Pray and ask God for his wisdom and direction because um, your situation can be very different than someone else's. Regularly study and meditate on God's word. That may sound like it's theoretical or academic, but for the people that uh, learn God's way of managing money and then they follow up, for those people, um, they're into God's word regularly. If you don't get into God's word on a regular basis, then what will happen is you, you probably will fall back into your old habits. That's what's going to happen. Evaluate where you're at financially. Proverbs 27, 23 says, Know well the condition of your herds and flocks and grains. You need to know where you're at financially and what's happening. And uh, develop and implement a budget. The key for developing a budget, implement it and follow up, is to make sure that you're spending less than you earn so you have a surplus to pay down debt and save for future needs. I'll actually go into budgeting in more detail in session three. Ask God to enable you to be content with his provision. That's Godliness with contentment is great game, Paul said. And it's godliness, um, contentment, they go together. Uh, learning to be content is really important. That is the antidote to so many uh, financial problems, so many worldly attitudes regarding money and material things. Things like selfishness, covetousness, greed, pride, envy, things that get people into debt. With your surplus of cash, pay off the most expensive debt first and the non-deductible debt. And in dependence on God, follow up until you're debt free. So are there any questions on, on how to get out of debt? <clears throat> There's one here. Sorry, what? what? Oh, the kind of debt is deductible is um, in Canada, if you borrow money and invest in um, investments or you borrow money and invest it in a business that's going to generate an income, that's considered deductible debt. So if you had some deductible debt at 4% and you had, a, say, a mortgage on your house at 4% uh, and they're both the same rate, you'd probably want to pay down the non-deductible debt first because you're not getting a tax deduction for it. So deductible debt, if it's at 4%, might only be costing you 2.5% after tax. So you'd pay down the non-deductible debt first is what you would do. Now, most people do not have deductible debt. Most people have not borrowed. Well, some people have borrowed to invest. Um, but it's, it's always better to pay the non-deductible debt down first if, if the rates are the same. Of course, the big thing is things like credit cards. I mean, you want to pay that off because <laughs> they're really expensive. Any other questions on steps to get out of debt? There's one at the back. Henry? Okay, go ahead and yell. I live in the state, so I don't know if you could answer this, but medical <clears throat> expenses. Like, because it's not covered by OHIP, how would you suggest paying off, like, a baby bill, for example? Okay. Um, in Canada, people with medical expense do get a tax credit. I don't know what happens in the States. I'm no U.S. tax expert. I think, like any debt, you just want to have a plan. You want to develop a budget to ensure you have a surplus each month and then gradually uh, eat away at that debt. Uh, the biggest reason people get into debt and they don't they have a problem because they actually have a deficit each month. They're actually spending more than they're making or they're spending all their income. So you gotta you gotta free up the cash flow each month. I'll talk more about that later. So um, thanks for your comments. Um, is there any other questions? Yeah. You mentioned earlier about um, at York University that um, Kids were being given credit cards, or I mean, yep. being offered credit cards, no? But then um, you also mentioned later that um, you might have to co-sign for your children because they mm -hmm. don't have a credit history. How yep. will they get credit history without yep. having a credit card? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. How do you get a credit card? How do you get a credit history without having a credit card? There's nothing wrong in and of itself with having a credit card. Um, for a young person to get a credit card, if they do, Fine. I mean, just make sure they use it only for needs, and they pay it off each month. And they don't have to pay it off often to get the credit history. The, the, the concern I have at the university is not just York. It's all the universities. They take, I think they take advantage of these, the inexperience of these young people. They give them a credit card, give them a limit of $1,000. 
The kids go out and usually squander the money. It's usually with lattes and dinners and eating. It's usually all kinds of stuff they don't need. I've seen so many of them and looked at them 10 years after the fact when they're still trying to pay it off or five years after. Um, and what happens? They run it up to the limit of $1,000. They don't suddenly require them to pay it back. They raise their limit. Because the credit card companies know if they can get the young people used to using credit, they can get them in, the young people in universities, college, if they can get new Canadians used to using credit. I know a lot of new Canadians, they get into this country, they're here three or four weeks, they got no assets, they don't even have a job yet, and the companies are offering them credit cards. If they can get you used to credit, and if they can get you to do what so many people are doing, running a balance on your credit card, say it's $20,000, and you run that consistently over a 50-year period, that's about $5,000 a year in interest you're paying over 50 years. It's a quarter of a million dollars, round numbers, in a lifetime that you're paying to credit card companies, often for things you really don't even need. And it's, they love it because they're making, let's face it, if we could make 18 to 28% on our RSPs, we'd be able to retire sooner, right? Um, it's, um, so they're taking advantage. So having a credit card, nothing wrong with that. I have a credit card. I use it. Make sure I pay it off every month. But it's, you just got to be uh, really careful with it because uh, it's the easiest way to get into debt. I think there's a question way over on this side. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Just a question regarding credit card kind of debt versus mortgage kind of debt. Yeah. Why is our government not more harsh on regulating the credit card uh, issuance such as you're speaking about and the debt factor associated to that versus coming with more stringent mortgage uh, rules yeah. and regulations? That's, that's a good question. Um, and I think maybe we should all appeal to our politicians. Um, like, I'd, even just having the warning on credit cards, I think, should be there, like the cigarettes. Uh, like I suggested earlier, that it's dangerous to your misuse of it is dangerous to your financial health and your marital health and your physical health. I think they should. And yes, they have constrained mortgages. The, the fear of the, what, what's been happening is that Canadian personal debt's been going up, 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 up. Canadian real estate in big, big city Canada real estate has increased significantly in value since 2008. We're one of the few places in the world where that's occurred. And the concern is we could have a real estate bubble if the debt gets too high. So I understand why they've done that. And, and frankly, I think they should do that kind of stuff. But they actually should have restraints, perhaps even more so on credit cards, because that, that really hurts. It's very expensive. My question is, is getting out of debt a family affair? How do you involve your children without overburdening them with, with what's happening in the family? Because <clears throat> sometimes you're trying to get out of debt and your children are demanding things that you know you can't afford. How do you tell them, you know, we can't afford it without letting them feel overwhelmed with what's going on in the family? That's a good question, a very good one. Certainly if mom and dad and parents are in debt and they're trying to get out of debt, um, and the kids, the kids generally are almost always asking for, for something. What's that saying I just heard? Freedom 55 doesn't occur when you hit 55. It occurs when your kids hit 55. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so you got to be careful. And uh, it's, I think it's okay for parents to explain to their... First of all, don't hesitate to say no. They need to, they need to hear some no answers. Jason, am I doing something wrong? Maybe we can get Henry up here. I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or getting a little feedback. They need to hear answer no from time to time is what they need. Um, because they're not always going to get a yes answer in real life. So they're not always going to get a yes answer. That's, that's absolutely for sure. Um, you don't have to tell them the details of your budget, although I've seen parents do that. Um, it's got advantages and disadvantages. One thing is they see some expenses they never realize exist, you know for the hydro and you know, property taxes, utilities. On the other hand, they can also come back and start telling you where to spend your discretionary income as well. <laughs> so um, I'd be careful, but certainly letting them know, saying no, that you can't afford it, uh, it you're just going to have to do that. <clears throat> and it's one thing I learned when I grew up, because <clears throat> my family did not have a lot of money, was my mother knew how to say no. And, uh, and so you got to learn that uh, people, young people have to learn they can't always get what they want. What do you do if you've already reached the point where you, your majority of your spending goes towards paying your bills and you don't have anything left over to save because you've got that much debt already? <clears throat> that's a good question. And um, that's where we, we have, um, I was going to mention it later, but I'll mention it now. We have about 30 financial coaches that are trained that can help you uh, deal with that. And certainly, 
That's one of the problems when you get into debt, trying to get out of debt. It's, hard, it's a lot harder to get out of debt than into debt. So I'd have to look at, we'd have to look at each individual circumstance. Uh, sometimes you do some refinancing. Um, there's different things. Sometimes you've got to downsize the house or go from two cars to one. Sometimes you've got to really look for some additional ways to get more income. Sometimes it's a combination. Uh, there's no simple answer because to answer your question is going to vary uh, from individual to individual. It, it, it's quite, that's where the financial coaching can come in. Comment earlier about uh, <clears throat> government uh, restrictions and regulations. They're no example. Yeah, I know. I know. Our governments are spending all kinds of money, no question about it. Um, uh, there is um, a saying that there is good debt and bad debt. Um, yeah. What, but, what are your um, views on leasing? Some people need a new car, they borrow the money yeah. to buy the car, and it depreciates as opposed yeah. to leasing where you don't own it, but at the end, I guess it's financially better. I'm not sure. That's an excellent question. A lot of people and a lot of financial advisors will tell you there's good debt, there's bad debt. Good debt is usually to borrow to invest in their mutual funds often, um, or borrow to invest somehow, or perhaps it's good debt to borrow and buy a house because the theory is it's going to go up in value, or it's good debt to borrow and invest in education. That distinction is not made in scripture between good debt and bad debt. Basically, Scripture discourages debt. It warns of the dangers of debt, period. It doesn't matter where it came from. Now, there's no question. When somebody, I think what you need to look at is not so much the debt, but where the spending was. When I sit down with, um, let's say, a young couple, and, and they graduated from university five years ago. They're both working full-time now. And they got all kinds of credit card debt from university. And they got all kinds of personal line of credit. Or any, any people we sit down with, they start looking at where they spent their money the last five years. So much of it was unnecessary. It was wants and desires, not needs. So there's no distinction in Scripture between good and bad. It's really a distinction of what's a wise purchase, what's a need that God's called you to do, versus what's an unwise purchase as opposed to a want and desire. You're buying something you don't need with money you don't have. Go ahead. Tom, if you are in a situation <clears throat> where you are choosing to pay your debt, between, mm -hmm. between paying your debt and giving to God's work? What would you do? Well, that's a good question. Because uh, often what happens, um, I'm glad you raised that, because the topic today is, we don't have a topic on giving here, although it's, it's a one big chapter in my book. Um, when people's debts accumulate, when people inadvertently spend a little more than they make and they accumulate debt, often one of the things that gets eliminated or reduced is giving. If you don't give 10% to your church or 10% to God's work on a regular basis, they're not going to come and repossess your car or repossess your home, right? But if you don't pay your mortgage payment, you don't pay your car loan payment, there's serious ramifications. And so often, what we see is the number one constraint to giving is not, <clears throat> most Christians know about the tithe. That, that's been taught. They know about it. The number one constraint to giving is not whether they should tithe or not. The constraint is they've inadvertently accumulated debt, they spend a little more than they made, the debt goes up, and as the debt goes up, the giving goes down. And um, <clears throat> you'll see in the example later, I still encourage giving to God's work. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled overflowing, your vats will bring over with new wine. God wants us to give us the first fruits, and often what Christians do is they give God the last fruits, they give them the leftovers. Now there's, they go out and they buy that 60 inch plasma screen TV that they didn't need. They buy, she buys clothes she didn't need. He buys a bunch of tools he doesn't need. Or maybe he goes and buys a car, 0% financing. They get stuff they don't need. They get squeezed. They take on debt they shouldn't have taken on. And so often what's happened is giving gets squeezed out. And that's not God's will. God wants you to uh, make giving to his work uh, a, a, a priority. And should you give when you're in debt? Yes, absolutely. Um, and how much to give? The guidelines, 10%. It's not a legal, legalism. That's another total topic. If you come on October 27th to Green Hills, actually uh, my colleague Dave Norton uh, will be talking on the topic of giving. It's I just have a testimony in response to that question <clears throat> because I was off um, in a car accident a couple of months ago and I started getting into the idea of God, well maybe if I don't give you my tithe I could be out of debt within two years. And 
word by word. He said he would give me wisdom, and I prayed, and that's how I'm here today. And the message from him was to give to me first the first fruits, and he'll give me wisdom to get out of debt. Yep. I, God, God will bless. Go ahead. That's Go what on. I was going to say. I always make my first check out to the church, no matter what. And you don't think by the end of the month you're going to have enough money, but there's always a surplus. I'll tell you one thing. Because God does provide. I've seen thousands of cases. I've never seen anybody get into trouble because they gave too much to God's work. <laughs> never seen that. But I've seen thousands of people that got into trouble because they bought stuff on credit they didn't need. So here's the case study. Uh, Jim and Jennifer, they're married. I just oh, want to get go ahead. One thing that I have learned listening to you now, I know it makes me feel good to spend something on what will make me feel good at that time. Mm -hmm. But then, is it good? It, it's good, but then, is it godly? Yeah, exactly. And some, some purchases just make you feel good for a short period of time. But long term, when you've got to pay the bill and, you, and, and pay off the debt with interest, it, it hurts you. So here's the case study. Jim and Jennifer are married, and they both earn average incomes. Within one year of marriage, they notice their credit card balance has increased. Though they thought this was no problem due to some one-time expenses they incurred as newlyweds. However, over the next two years, the balances on their credit cards and personal line of credit increased substantially. They did not understand why this was occurring. As a result, they decided to attend a biblical financial study. They were amazed how much God's word had to say on finances. Jim and Jennifer realized that they had inadvertently been violating a number of biblical financial principles. <coughs> Sorry. Over the next several months, they studied God's word on finances and meditated on several scriptures to help change the way they think about money and material things. They then recorded all their expenses for three months, which revealed that they were spending more than they were earning. This explained why their debts were increasing. Jim and Jennifer developed and implemented a budget to ensure they were spending less than they were earning, and they purposely used the surplus to pay down debt. Jim and Jennifer first focused on paying off their credit cards as the interest rates were very high. They destroyed all of their credit cards and kept with just one each. They agreed not to use the credit card unless it was absolutely necessary. Next, they paid down their personal line of credit. In the process, it was necessary to reduce their expenditures. Although it was difficult, they prayed and trusted God to enable them to persevere with their reduced lifestyle and the reduction of their debts. Within three years, they had paid off all their credit cards and their personal line of credit. They both felt like 100 pounds was lifted off their backs. They didn't realize the burden of their debt load. Today, they've developed a new budget where the surplus is being applied against their mortgage. They learned that by just paying $400 a month extra against the mortgage, they will save about $50,000 in interest and be totally debt-free within nine years. Jim and Jennifer regularly thank the Lord for the financial wisdom in his word and how God has enabled them to be content with a reduced lifestyle. So here's the first question. Uh, list below the actions that Jim and Jennifer originally took that were not consistent with God's principles. Provide a reference to Scripture for each point, if you can. So what, what were they originally doing that was not consistent with Scripture? We went over some of this this morning. I think you folks are getting it. Just a couple of quick answers. <clears throat> yep, they became a slave to Lemberg. They took on too much debt, and they became a slave to lender and ended up having some problems. Yeah. Real quick one. Yeah, they didn't know the condition of their herds and flocks and grains. Proverbs 27, 23 tells us they didn't know what was happening financially. They really didn't, uh, didn't know that. So often when we sit down with couples, he makes X, she makes Y, they all, the answer question often is, we make pretty good income. Where does it all go? And, and they really don't know. And by the way, these principles that I'm teaching, although I make, have case studies that are couples, the principles apply exact, pretty much the same, slightly different application, but the principles are the same if you're single. Um, you've got to make sure you're spending less than you're earning and that uh, you have a surplus to pay down, pay down debt as well. So here's one of the things. First of all, they didn't know where their money was going. They were not aware they were, their spending was greater than their income. They were accumulating debt. Those first two answers were given. They had not developed and implemented a budget. It's very biblical to have, have a budget of some kind. Um, they had not been content to live within God's provision. Uh, they had no savings for un unexpected expenses. Remember Proverbs 21.20? The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. 
They were not aware of what God's word says on finances. Uh, they did not seek God's counsel in respect to finances. They made financial decisions based upon their own personal ju judgment and personal desires rather than their financial facts. Proverbs 24 says, By wisdom a house is built, through understanding it is established, through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Notice the key words there, wisdom, understanding, knowledge. You need to know where you're at financially. You need to have some sort of a, a budgeting system that basically uh, tracks your expenses and tells you what's happening. Are you spending more than you're making? Are you spending less? Are your debts going up? Are they going down? And I'll go through the Copeland budgeting system later. So questions, list below the actions that Jim and Jennifer are now taking that are consistent with biblical principles. What are they doing now that's consistent with scripture? Raise your hand if you got an answer. Living within their means. They're living within their means, yep, yep, excellent. Anything else? They've learned to be content, absolutely, good one. They've started to make sacrifices. They've started to be, make sacrifice. Remember, Jesus said we, we're going to come after him. We need to uh, deny ourselves. They're paying down their debt, Proverbs 22, 7. They're seeking God. Now they're seeking God, seeking his direction, his wisdom. Yep. Before, they were just making decisions based on their own personal desires and gut feel, which is very dangerous. Seeking godly <clears throat> financial advice. Yep. Seeking godly financial advice, seek going to the Lord himself. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. They did a budget and they stuck to it. Yep, exactly. Go ahead. They prayed and trusted God. Absolutely, excellent. Yep. Good answers. They studied God's word and seeked his direction. Yep. You got to get into, I, I know I mentioned it earlier, but if, if you go away, if you don't get into God's word regularly and what it says on finances, the odds are you'll slip back into your old habits. So in addition to the previous statement about uh, studying God's word, I think they, they, they re study relevant scriptures and meditate on them uh, <coughs> and apply them. Yep, yep. Excellent. They took stock of what they actually had available instead of just spending yep. without thinking about it. That's Proverbs 27, 23. They, they figured out where they were at financially. Most people don't know that. Go ahead. They disciplined themselves by reading the Bible every single day. Yep. yep. There's no substitute for getting into God's word. As in James, they were doers of the word, not just hearers. Yep. They followed up. They did something. It's easy. These are excellent. I think of Deuteronomy 6 where it says, These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Uh, what God is saying there in Deuteronomy 6 is have his word in front of you all the time. Um, be meditating on it. One practical thing I do, um, I now got some of it on my iPod, but I'm, I'm not a high-tech guy, is I, I put scriptures as God speaks to me through his word. I'll uh, just copy and paste them from a Bible software onto Word, and I print it out, and then I'll have it in my pocket, and I'll look at that several times in a day. You know, by the end of the week, you've got to memorize. But what's more important is it's not about memorizing scripture. It's about changing the way you think, because Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the way you renew your mind is in God's word. It's God through his word and through his spirit that can change the way you think. So you folks have done great. You've, you've got a lot of these answers. They studied, here's my answers. They studied and implemented God's word on finances. Um, they now understand their financial position, their debt load, and where their money is being spent. Uh, they are diligently planning their finances by using a budget. They are making debt reduction a priority. They reduce the temptation of easy credit by destroying two credit cards. That's important to remove those temptations. <clears throat> and uh, they've sacrificed by reducing their lifestyle. They learn to be content in dependence upon God. That's how Paul did it. That's how we have to do it. You can't, you can't do that on your own. Uh, they persevered with debt reduction and a moderated lifestyle. And they trusted God to enable them to implement his financial principles. 
Uh, in John 15, 5, Jesus said that uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So we really can't do anything apart from uh, dependence upon God, especially in terms of changing the way you think about money and material things and uh, changing a lot of, uh, uh, and learning to be content. They regularly thank God for his financial wisdom for enabling them to be content with a reduced lifestyle. That's important to have a thankful heart, thanking God as to what you do have as opposed to um, coveting what uh, someone else has. Uh, they're totally different. So here's a brief overview of their finances. I'm not going to spend much time on this because I go into more detail on the Copeland budgeting system in the next session. But this couple, that you'll see in a minute, their income's about 5000 a month after taxes. They're not tithing because they're getting squeezed because they're spending more than they're making and they got debt to pay and the debt is squeezing out their tithe. They have certain housing costs, mortgage, property taxes, utilities, you can see them all there, a couple thousand a month. They spend um, $700 a month on food. Now, if they had two teenage boys, that'd probably be 1000 a month. Um, <laughs> so, um, and a automobile replacement, they're not saving anything for that. They should be, but right now they're behind the eight ball, as you'll see, they're spending more than they're making. Uh, they're making the minimum payment on your credit card's debt and their loan. If you're making the minimum payment on your credit card debt or any loans, that's actually a red, that's a red flag. That's a warning signal. You can't continue to do that for forever. You, you just can't. Um, that's that's uh, it's going to get you in, into trouble. But they're doing it because they've spent more than they've earned. They've accumulated debt. They have different types of expenses. Um, and um, if we come down to the bottom here, what's key is you look at the bottom is when they factored in their monthly and non-monthly expenses, they're actually spending $700 a month more than they're earning. So that means every, every year they're going into debt about $8,400. That is so common. We see it so common. And run up the credit cards for a few years, and then once they get too high, take out the personal line of credit against the home, pay off the credit cards, and just keep it rolling. And we've seen people running monthly deficits. Uh, it's, it's not just a few months. It's often several years. I've seen it uh, as long as 20, 25 years. But five to 10 years is quite common, and you can get away with it. So here's their, their, their budget after they implemented God's financial principles. In faith, they trusted God and raised their giving to a tithe. It's not a legalism. It's a guideline, but certainly that's what Scripture's guideline is, is to give 10%. On the housing expense, there's not much you can do with most of these. You can cut down the utilities a bit, but you can't do, change most of them unless you downsize their house. They're not going to do that just yet. They're going to cut back on their food expense by a couple hundred. They're going to, they're going to go from two cars to one car. That saves a lot of money. They're, um, and if you go through the rest of their expenses, here's what's important. By the end of it, after they implement biblical principles, they got a surplus of 500 a month, and they can use that to start paying down debt. And that's really what the key is about budgeting. And I'll go into that in more detail in, in, a, in a minute. So um, that's uh, basically session... Um, number two, and I'm now going to go to uh, session number three that deals specifically with budgeting. And uh, are there any questions uh, at this point? Tom, <clears throat> oh, go it's ahead. not really a question, but it's an, an insight. I think all throughout uh, this uh, first two sessions, you and based on the case studies that you presented, the operative word is they. You always say they, they, they. And I think that's key in, in financial management, God's way, especially for couples. I think both parties have to be committed. It cannot yep. just be one party. And, oh, I and, agree. And we can say that success stories are uh, a function of the, the two parties getting involved yep. in, in agreeing to commit to doing, managing finances God's yep. way. I agree. Um, there's no substitute for both husband and wife pulling in the same direction. Now, having said that, I've seen lots of cases, hundreds of them, where one spouse wants to reduce debt and manage money God's way, but the other one doesn't. And that makes it difficult for the spouse that wants to do it God's way. They're, they're still best to manage the money they have control of God's way. Otherwise, if they go crazy and spend money, it'll get, it'll get worse. Secondly, they can, they can um, <clears throat> pardon me, Set the example and uh, start to pray. Proverbs 21.1, the heart of the king is in the Lord's hands and the Lord directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. Pray that God will, will change their heart um, of the other spouse. Go ahead. 
Um, I wanted to know, <coughs> if you have some savings, like maybe a couple of thousand, and you have a particular debt or some debt, would you advise using some of your savings to pay down the debt so that you can get a handle on it and then put some more back in savings when you get back to a certain spot? Uh, generally speaking, um, you, you want to pay down your credit cards first for sure because they're so expensive, right? Now, having a bit of savings, say $1,000, uh, as an emergency fund, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but certainly the focus needs to be paying down the debt. Um, and especially if it's expensive credit card debt. Like I would do that even before you start saving for your next car, that kind of stuff. Everything okay here, Jason? Do I need a tech guy? <laughs> okay. All right, here we are on budgeting. Oh, sorry, is there another one? Okay. If I have a line of credit and also mortgage, and uh, do I ha do I pay the line of credit first before the pay more mortgage, or what do I do? Okay, you got a line of credit, you got a mortgage. Which do you pay first? I'd pay the one with the higher interest rate. Now the only thing is with the mortgage, don't don't incur one of their three month penalties to sort of pay it down faster, because the three month penalties to pay down a mortgage fast is very expensive. By the way, when you do negotiate your mortgage, always try to have flexibility in making early payments. So you know you can double your payments sometimes with no extra penalties. So have flexibility. But I'd pay the one with the higher interest rate. That's what I would do between those two. And uh, if I, when I do, uh, I have to renew my mortgage now. Do I? Do I heard that I, it is a lot better to pay by by monthly or. Uh, so the, the faster you can pay the mortgage, the better. If you can pay it weekly, you'll pay it off faster than if you pay it bi-weekly. If you pay it bi-weekly, you'll pay it off faster than if you pay it monthly. So whatever you can do, whatever. A lot of that depends on how people get paid. If they're paid bi-weekly, often they'll do it that way. Okay? Thanks. So, another quick one? Go ahead. I was wondering, if you have credit card debt, Yep. Can you still be saving? Because to me, if you're saving, you're, you've still got this high interest credit card. It's kind of <coughs> defeating the purpose that you yep. go to the credit card. But if you're not saving anything, then you've got nothing set aside for a new car or whatever might come up. So you're back to the credit card and it's a vicious circle. I understand. The only thing is um, credit card debt is so expensive, I would make that the priority. I'd still make it the priority. You might want to set $1,000 aside just as an emergency fund, but I would make the credit card, paying down that credit card debt, the priority. Once you get that paid off, then look at start pay saving to replace your automobile, that kind of stuff, make for those other medium-term things. So session three is on budgeting, and um, hey, Jason. Jason up there. I don't know where all that noise is coming from. Okay, budgeting. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays a foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Really what Christ is saying in this parable is that you need to plan ahead. And uh, the most practical way to plan ahead is a budget. Proverbs 21.5 the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. The emphasis here is planning diligently. It's what God wants us to do. Um, <clears throat> when you do plan, when you do develop a budget, by the way, if you don't like, a lot of people don't like the word budget. They feel it's going to constrain them. Um, <clears throat> call it a spending plan. Call it a cash flow plan. If you don't like the word budget, that's fine. The, um, but it's, they're basically the same thing. You've got to have some sort of plan on how you're going to spend your money, and then you've got to follow up to make sure you're spending less than you're earning, and you've got a surplus to pay down debt. So, and that's what the, the purpose of, of budgeting is. If you don't do that, if you don't, I've, I've met so many people, I don't want a budget, that's a drag, you know, and they'll end up being in some pretty significant trouble afterwards. So. Hey, Jason. We're going to get our technical users on this back.
Tom, do you have a different uh, financial flowchart or budget for, say, a commission income person versus uh, typical corporate employment? Where, where are we? Raise your hand. I uh, lost track of... Uh, okay. It's pretty well much the same planning system. The only thing is, and that's a good question, with somebody that's on commissions, um, you're, you're going to want to probably take a... I mean, the ideal is you, you plan your budget based upon, let's say your commission plus salary, based upon your sort of like your minimum salary that you know is going to come in. And then you allow the commissions just to show up as, a, as an extra. Um, on the other hand, if you're on pure commission... Um, then I think you have to look at historically what's happened, the kind of income you've earned, and maybe take an average and base your budget on an average. It's probably the best you can do. Go ahead. Um, one, you keep mentioning credit card debt. Probably one of the best ways to get around that would be to actually get one of those uh, prepaid ones where yep. you put in a certain amount, and then when you get down to zero, you have to replenish it again. Yep. That saves you all the interest and uh, accumulation that you would get otherwise with the interest charges. Good, good comment. For people who have a history of uh, misusing credit cards, one of the best things you can do is get a prepaid credit card, as this gentleman mentioned, or you can get a debit card. At least that way, you can't spend money that you don't have. So, um, you know, that's, that's what you want to do. These scriptures, I'll just mention them here and we'll come to that question. By wisdom a house is built, through understanding is established, through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. We've talked about these scriptures already. The key is you need to know your financial facts. And that's what a proper budgeting system will do. And uh, go ahead with the question. I have two questions. One question is about uh, getting uh, life insurance. Okay. Because right now we are, we are paying about more than 500 for for my husband and myself. And another is, if you're a relative, uh, for example, I'm from the Philippines, right? If, if you have a relative who is sick in the Philippines and you pay for medical expenses for them, is it wrong to get from your personal credit line, especially if you have read an equity in your home? Thank you. Yeah, two, two good questions there. Um, life insurance, to me, life insurance, you buy it to the extent that you need to meet family needs. First Timothy 5.8 says, if someone does not provide for the needs of his own family, especially those of his close relatives, he's worse than an unbeliever. So having some life insurance, especially for young couples, and especially where there's a young family, and especially having it on the, high, the higher main income earner, is, is I think is important, and that should be purchased. Now, as you get older and as you get closer to retirement, you, you, you probably don't need the same amount of life insurance. Now, how much life insurance you need, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to know more about the facts of your situation. Uh, the key is this. You buy enough life insurance to uh, provide for the needs of the family is what you do. You don't want to make it so they have a, a huge amount uh, that they profit because that's, that's not really God's will that they have a huge amount, but you buy enough to provide for the needs. <clears throat> in terms of helping your relative in the Philippines with a health issue, that's... I mean, first of all, you've got to obviously pray and see if God wants you to do that. And if God does, it sounds like he does, then, you know, there's, I mean, there's, it's not wrong to use the credit, the, the line of credit to pay for that. It's not wrong. Just be careful that um, it doesn't end up causing you and your husband financial problems as well. Have a plan to pay that back. And, and helping out people, especially with health issues, I think is a commendable thing to do. And most of the time, God wants us to do that. Uh, but you can only help to the extent you can afford. You don't want to... I've seen some people help out others, and then they end up in uh, financial difficulty and getting into trouble. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the Copeland budgeting system. It provides a practical way to keep track of your expenses and to plan your finances. And by the way, nice thing about this budgeting system, it's free. You can download it. It's uh, from BibleFinance.org. And uh, not only is the uh, system free, but also... There's a 30-minute uh, instructional video on the website uh, that will go into more detail than what I'm going to go in today. <clears throat> so you should watch, uh, watch that. Here's the forms of the budgeting system. Assets and liabilities, revenues for a typical month, non-monthly expense planning, I'll talk more about that in a minute, saving account allocation, estimated monthly budget, actual expenses and revenues, and budget analysis. We're only going to focus on forms 2, 3, and 5 today. Those are the, uh, the key forms, anyhow, in determining your monthly cash flow. Because your monthly cash flow 
is really it's just so, so important. You've got to make sure you're spending less than you're making every month. The figures below are provided for a hypothetical couple. I'm just calling them Bill and Sue. So if there's a Bill and Sue here, this is not your budget. <laughs> um, and they got two children in a house. Your expenses may be different, that's fine, but the principles are the same, and the purpose of this example is to de demonstrate how to develop a workable budget. Initially, Bill and Sue recorded all of their income and expenses for the past year on Form 6. That's just that Excel form in my system that allows you to record your expenses, and I encourage people to update it every two or three days because it's often easy to forget where you're spending money. And just start to track your expenses. I'll tell you one thing. Tracking your expenses can make a big difference. Number one, you become more conscious of where the money's going. And two, when you write it down, your spouse is going to see it. So, so often, you don't want your spouse to know you're, you bought that new tool for 20 bucks that you really didn't need her. She may not want you to know she bought her 22nd pair of shoes, right? It, it's, um, so that, that can actually lower the expenses right there, just, just tracking it. And even yourself, you think, wow, we start adding this up. I spend an awful lot of money uh, uh, eating out or uh, buying coffees or whatever. It, 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 it adds up over a while. So, um, so here's what happened after they, they looked at their finances. Their, their revenues for a typical month is simple. His after-tax income is $4,000 a month. Hers is $1,000 a month. She works part-time. They got $5,000 a month of uh, revenue. That's a typical after-tax income for a family in the city of Toronto, round numbers. This is form number three. These are the non-monthly expenses. These expenses are really important because I find often when people say, I, we ask them to sort of try to figure out where their money's going, they'll remember their major expenses like their mortgage, their property taxes, their utilities, but they for, tend to forget and in incorporating into their budget some of their non-monthly expenses, including those that, um, that, that they don't, they just, including those that can be uh, quite, uh, you know, just from time to time. Let's take an example. Look at auto repairs. They've got two cars. I, they found out over the last several years that on average they paid about uh, $2,400 per year for car expenses. That's about $1,200 per car for the repairs and maintenance. So that averages out to $200 a month. By the way, if you don't know how much your car repairs are, statistical average in Canada, the average car requires about $100 a month in repairs on average. Now, if yours is newer, it may very well be less. If it's older, it could be more. But that's what they were finding. So what they learned and figured out was, hey, we're incurring on average $2,400 a year or $200 a, a month on, on car expenses. We should, they should be setting that aside in a savings account, and they weren't doing that. And so what happened when a car expense came up, it was forcing them into debt. It was forced to put it on the credit card because they were spending all their regular income, and that's part of the problem. Anyone here ever had an unexpected auto repair? <laughs> I, think, I think we all have. And so, and some people say to me, wait a second, Tom, I don't know what it is, so how can I set money aside for it? What you can do is set aside estimates. And if you're setting aside $200 a month, you've done it for three months, you've got $600, and then I say, oh boy, you've got a car expense for $700, at least you've got most of the money. If you don't set aside any money, uh, saving for these non-monthly expenses, the bottom line is it's likely going to go on your credit card and cause you to go further into debt. Uh, other expenses, property taxes. Now, this couple happens to pay it four times a year, $3,600. That's $300 a month they should be setting aside. If your property taxes is being paid as part of your mortgage payment, you don't, you don't have to calculate it on this form. House maintenance, uh, on average, $1,800 a year, so they should be setting aside $150 a month. And you can just go down through this. Vacation's another example. Uh, let's say auto insurance, $2,100. That may only come up once a year. But, you know, so often people don't plan for that non-monthly expense. So what happens again? They're forced into debt. It goes on the personal line of credit. Same with vacation. Very few people save for their next year's vacation. And so often it goes on the credit card. And so the name of the game here is that you need to save for non-monthly expenses. Otherwise, you'll incur debt when they arise. And that proverb that I, I want you to meditate on, 2120, the wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. That's such a simple proverb, but it's so, it's so, uh, so important. So this is, their, 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 this is form number five of the Copeland Budgeting System, and this gives you an overview of where they're at right now. This couple, they're not tithing. They want to tithe, but because they spent more than they made, they've accumulated debt. They've got credit card debt, as you'll see in a line of credit. The tithe is getting reduced. It's getting squeezed out. 
Their mortgage is $1,200 a month, property taxes, utilities. You can see all the expenses there. They're spending about $2,425 a month. When you factor everything in, including the maintenance, when you average it out on a monthly basis, their food, $700 a month. Their automobile replacement, they should be saving to replace their car, but they're not. Gas and oil, all their other expenses. They're making, you notice it's in red. They're making minimum payments on the credit cards, personal line of credit. Not a good idea, but they're being forced to do that because they've accumulated debt. And now they're just robbing the P Peter to pay Paul. They're just trying to make their, their cash flow balance somehow. Eating out, vacation, sports, gym, clothing. You can see all the different expenses there. And again, the key with this couple, similar to so many we see, they got a monthly deficit. They're spending more than they're making, and they're accumulating debt. And it's interesting. I'm just going to give you one challenge here. Matthew 6:24 says, "No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money." And so often, uh, people are serving money and material things, and they don't realize it. Actually, if you look at your checkbook and your credit card statements. Where you spend your money is often an indication of your true priorities. People may say, I put God first. Oh, yeah, he's first in my life. But often if you look at where they're spending their money, the indi it indicates otherwise. Often our checkbook and our credit card statements reveal more about our, our true priorities than what we may wish. Um, so this couple, they track their expenses, determine they're spending more than they're making. They had done the debt restructuring a few times. It didn't work. Um, and uh, it just, it's just like similar to the other situation I gave you. They spent quality time with the Lord in prayer. They meditated on God's word. They learned to be content with less, so critical. They developed a budget. Here's some of the things they did. They downsized from two cars to one. Now, maybe not everybody can do that. Build in more of the house and cars repairs. They trusted God and increased their giving to 10%. They earned some additional income. You'll see that. Uh, You've got to be practical there. You don't want to kill yourself or have a life out of balance. You have no time to spend with your wife and kids. That's no good. You've got to still want to have a life, balanced lifestyle. They reduced a number of expenses where they could, and they generally became more capable where they spent their money. And so here's their revised budget. Um, they now have $5,300 of income. They earned some additional income of $300. And like I mentioned earlier, earning more income is good, but if, only if it's practical. And be careful of Jesus' warning. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. If you earn more income, it's good, but if you're not careful in how you manage the additional income... And what will happen is that it's just human nature. The lifestyle can go up, and you can still... I've seen people whose income has gone up huge numbers, and they just keep spending it all, and uh, they, it, the, the additional income doesn't solve their problem. They've got to learn to be content with less as well. Here's the revised non-monthly expense planning for the budget. Um, you can see the ones in blue have changed. The house maintenance was reduced because he's doing more of it. The auto repairs, auto insurance has gone down because they went from two cars to one. Vacation, instead of going away, they're going to do day trips. So that went down a lot. And there's some things that maybe you can't change, like, like health care. But the key is now it's $813 a month for non-monthly expenses, when before it was uh, over $1,200. When we factor this all in, they also stepped out in faith, and they're giving God 10% of their income, 530 bucks. The house expenses, are, they don't... Fortunately, this couple is getting a hold of their problems now. They don't have to downsize their house. But sometimes we see cases where people do have to downsize their house. They're so much in debt. And by the way, if you have to, I've seen a number of couples, I think of one just recently, they're actually praising God. They downsized their house with a $200,000 mortgage, a, smaller, a mortgage smaller by $200,000, less utilities, less property taxes. They're, they're now sensing a real peace in their area of finances. They're not running the negative cash flow. They actually got a surplus each month. They've learned to be content with less, and God's really blessing them. If you run through all of these expenses, the bottom line here, what's important, there's a surplus of 532 a month, and they can use that to start paying off their credit cards and their, uh, their lines of credit, and they can, um, they can get themselves uh, out of debt. And um, so it's, it's, uh, the, the Lord is blessing them. As I mentioned, there's about 40 references in the Bible to planning, and generally they admonish us to plan ahead. Studying God's Word and making planning the... Uh, make prayer and the study of God's word the foundation of your financial planning or budgeting meetings. God has promised to provide us his wisdom and direction, and he will often speak to us through, through his word and through his spirit. And as Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Be willing to do, do God's word. So that's a high-level uh, overview of that, that budget. Um, what, do you have any uh, questions? Um, I know that's fairly quick, but uh, I wanted to give you an overview. Go ahead. Um. Just a quick question. 
I noticed that the donations, tithing, is on the net here. Um, yep. We've been told that it should be on the gross. Good, good, good question. What's your thought on that? Um, the uh, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. There is a case that uh, it should be on the gross, and ideally that's where they should get to. Uh, for this couple, they're in so much debt, um, that was too much of a, a leap, I guess, for them. But at least they're doing it on their net, and ideally they should get to, the, to their gross. I, I, it's, again, it's, giving's a whole different topic. The real emphasis in Scripture is not so much to tithe or not to tithe. We're no longer under Mosaic law. The emphasis is really to give generously and sacrificially. What's generous and sacrificial? My humble opinion, a single mom with a modest income and three kids, she may not be able to tithe, but if she gives 5 or 6% of her income, that could very well be sacrificial giving. A high income earner, the, the combined income husband and wife, it's high income. Tithing is just giving out of obedience. It's not sacrificial. They should consider, since they have so much, to actually going well beyond the 10%. Go ahead. Yes, I just have an idea about the auto type of uh, debt yep. or, or spending, I mean. Uh, as far as myself, I, I sort of feel that if your interest cost for your loan is less than the repairs, plus you, you do better on your depreciation, yep. then uh, I think you're f better to have a newer car. Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> yes and no. Um, if you go into my book, it, it does a comparison of, of um, well, there's two issues with cars. One, do you borrow and buy or do you save for it? Unequivocally, if you go into my book, there's an example of borrower versus buyer. People are better long term to save for their cars and pay cash. Um, but the new versus used, it, it really depends. Often when people are in debt, they're, they're, they almost have to get a used car. And there's nothing wrong with getting a good used car. Um, you've got to be selective, get a, get a mechanic that you know that's honest to check it out for you. I've certainly had a, a lot of, uh, seen people, with, people do well with a, with a used car. Um, getting a new car, it's not wrong to get a new car, but often um, it's, it's, it's more expensive, obviously, and you're, you're, taking on, you're taking on a loan, an obligation. Long term, you want to be with no debt. Even, you don't even want to have car loan debt or car leases or anything like that. That's where you want to be long term is ideally to, uh, to get rid of that. So um, do as the Lord directs. It's um, certainly um, one thing that is expensive, I'll mention this on cars. If you buy a new car and you turn it in every three years, uh, that's very expensive. You're taking the big hit on depreciation. Now, if you're in business and you're doing, putting on 100,000 kilometers a year, you may have to do that. But that's not the case for most people. So... Um, in some cases, people have to, have to buy a used car, and that's a better thing for them. I just want you to clarify the uh, downsize in the house, because if you're going to downsize, mm -hmm. does that mean you're going to sell your home, yeah. pay off debt? Because if you go to the bank with all this debt again, they might not want to finance you for a home yeah. if you've got all this debt around you. Well, the idea is this. Let's say, um, let's say the house is worth 400000 and between mortgage debt and line of debt, it, you, you run it up to 450000 you, in some cases, people can't, you look at their cash flow, they, you simply can't get the budget to balance and create a surplus each month. It's, it can't be done unless they downsize their house. So I think of one couple recently, they downsized from 600 down to about 350. In that case, they reduced their mortgage by 250. And now because of the lower mortgage payment, lower property taxes, utilities, they could, they could manage their monthly cash flow and actually have a surplus. So they, definitely you sell your house and you take out the equity and you use that to uh, buy a smaller house. What's going to be a real problem, if we ever get a correction in real estate values, like we had in the early 90s, and the houses drop in value below the mortgage, that's, that's going to be mega problems. Or if interest rates go way up, go ahead. Hello. Um, we have a family business, and I'm just wondering, how, where do you base the tight? Would it be on the gross income of the business or the net? That's, that's a good question. With a, with a business, um, you, you, you pretty well, in most cases, have to tithe on the net income of the business, but before the owner's remuneration. Uh, I think of clients, I'm in public accounting as well, I have my own accounting firm, and I think of clients, let's say their revenue is a million dollars a year, and um, their, their, their profit might be, in some businesses it's high volume, low margin, their profit might only be $80,000 a year. And um, they can't tithe on their gross. If they do that, they're going to go into debt and get into trouble. They're not going to pay their creditors. 
Um, in that case, it's your gross income in a sense, your gross net income before tax. And so I'd say the business should, the guideline is to give based upon the net income of the business before tax and before owner's remuneration. Any other questions? Yes. I just, go ahead. Which, oh, yeah. Um, just uh, two questions or just your opinion. One, uh, what's your thoughts on um, putting your taxes into your mortgage or paying them separately? And the second is, what's your thoughts on overdraft protection on your account? Um, putting taxes into your mortgage or not, it's, it's flexible. The key is long as you save for it and make sure it's paid on time. Some people may find it more convenient to include the property taxes in their mortgage. Then they don't have to worry about it. Um, and in terms of, uh, what was your second question? Overdraft protection. There's nothing wrong with overdraft protection. It's like there's nothing wrong with having a personal line of credit. You just got to really make sure that you use it carefully. You got to keep track of the balance in your, your bank account. Often what happens when people get overdraft protection, they just keep spending money and they go into debt and they don't really realize they're going into debt. And then they got to figure out a way later to pay it off. I mean, the best scenario is not to have overdraft protection, not to have a line of credit, but operate with your own cash in the bank. That's, that's ideally where you want to be eventually. Another question? Go ahead. Hi. Uh, on one of the schedules you had there, it said set aside each month something towards car repair, yep. Christmas, vacations, whatever else. If you're setting that aside each month in an account somewhere, yep. rather than paying off debt, with yep. that money, the way I do it's probably wrong, yep. but um, throw that money to the, any credit card debt, reduce yep. the credit card, and if I need a car repair, it's always there. So that my savings yep. is sort of the credit card that I paid off. That's yep. kind of counter. Okay. What, what it, the purpose of what I've done here on Form 3 is the, for the sake of developing an ongoing practical monthly cash flow plan or monthly budget. Um, if somebody has a lot of credit card debt, as, as I'm, see what I'm, the reason I'm doing this right here is say, okay, can we get a surplus here? And what I'm suggesting is they don't have to downsize their home, fortunately. They can generate a surplus of 532,000. 532, this is not working. Sorry, $532. <laughs> um, and they would use that and apply that against their credit card um, debt. Now, if somebody has credit card debt that's costing a lot of money, I do suggest that they get a line of credit to pay it off so the line of credit, the rate might be 4% versus 18%. I do suggest that, but then I warn them, you know, that doesn't solve the problem. You gotta make sure you got a positive cash flow. And then use this surplus to pay off the, uh, the line of credit. But if they got credit card debt that they can't refinance, then I agree with you 100%. If they got credit card debt they can't refinance, you're gonna have to forgo saving for some of these things for a season until you get that under control. Go ahead. Um, I'm uh, talking for immigrants like myself, yep. or our newly uh, new citizens. Should uh, if you come to Canada in your late 40s mm -hmm. and then you become a citizen you know, yep. so after three or five years, should we just? Of course, you're, you come here with your family and your kids are grown, so we don't have RESPs and we don't have anything mm -hmm. like that. No, saved up for their for their education, yep. should we get into debt to buy a house, or should we just keep renting and then go on OSAP and, and you know, and then um, what do we do for retirement? That's a good question, and I think I'm gonna address it in the next usually, set of slides. Yeah, most of us yep. will not be having the kind of income that you, uh, you showed, like $5,000 a mm -hmm. month net, yep. Um, most of us won't be having that. Right. Yeah, so what do we do? Let me, sometimes there's some questions, uh, I'm gonna, because your question leads into this, this next section about discerning God's will. Sometimes there's no simple answer. It's not wrong with having an OSAP loan. It's not wrong with having any particular debt. Just God discourages, warns of the danger, and you need to pray and wait upon the Lord, discern God's will. Is there a fast question? Then I'll a go into this. Question uh, about insurance again, and I'm looking yeah. for your wisdom on amount of insurance or in fact does does having insurance or having too much insurance show a lack of faith and trust in God's provision for the future yeah that's a good question I mean 
Having too much insurance can represent, um, that's not God's will. Having way more than what your family needs, um, that can demonstrate a lack of faith. It can demonstrate selfishness or greed or whatever. We don't know. It depends on the person. How much insurance to have? What, what basically what I, what I suggest people do is, uh, they, and it's typically, especially young couples, need the most life insurance, actually, I find. Do your budget and say, okay, let's suppose the husband dies. His income of 4000 a month is gone. That's 50000 a year. How much insurance do you need to replace that in order to meet the family's needs, I'd say for at least 25 years. You want to at least get your kids through school um, and, and, and at least minimum 25 years. Well, if you do the math, 25 years at, at uh, 50,000 a year, you do the math out, what's that, 1.25 million. So they might want to look at, I'm assuming no income on, on the money. Because today, if you buy GICs and stuff, the interest is pretty small, right? So I'm assuming, you, so that's the kind of thing. Now for a young man, to buy a million and a quarter of life insurance, that's not a big premium. It's quite manageable. As you get older, it gets very high, but as you get older, you usually don't need as much insurance because your kids are growing. They should be self-sustaining at some point. <laughs> Maybe not till uh, they're 55, as I mentioned, but they should be. You really want to get them to be independent, and um, you, you know, it, it's just, um, it's, it's a calculation. So the key is to meet needs and figure out what's, what's my family going to need if I, were, if I were to die. Okay, go ahead and I'll... Is your book around here on the boat? Say it again? Your book. You say you have a book. Yeah, it's back there. Yeah, Financial Management God's Way, yeah. Is it here? Yeah, it's, it's at the resource table. Tony, Tony has them. And there's two types. There's the participants' uh, book, and then there's actually the leader's book, which is the same as the participants, but the leader has the suggested solutions. And it's intended for the leader who's going to lead a small group. You don't have to go through a small group. You can actually do it. Go through it yourself, or you and your spouse, or you can do it in a small group, whatever you like. Go ahead. Uh, what would you suggest with, um, like, for example, I have a locked-in RSP, but then I also have a monthly money taken out for an RSP that could be withdrawn every now and then. Okay. Would I rather use that money instead to pay um, a line of credit instead of Taking, having that taken out of my account for a RSP that could be um, withdrawn any time when I have a locked in. Okay, your question, I, I'd have to look at the particular facts. I'd probably suggest you connect with one of my financial coaches because it's gonna depend on your mar personal marginal tax rate uh, as to whether you should draw down RSP and pay down the line of credit or use the line of credit or what. It depends on your, your tax rates and your cash flow, certainly. Um, because the financial, a financial manager would usually advise you to do that so you will have some um, um, tax returns when you file for T4s at the end of the year. So you have some tax refunds because you're refunds, putting money into yes. the RSP. And that's okay, but, but you got to, um, long term when you're putting money into an RSP, long term you want to be in a position where you're doing it with a surplus of cash uh, each month. That's where you want to be ideally as opposed to borrowing it. Because the problem is you put in the RSP, part of it's probably going to go into equities. They can go down, but the debt is still there. Go ahead. I would like to ask for your opinion regarding uh, funeral, funeral services, cemetery lot, or cremation. Okay. Since I have a life insurance, I haven't uh, made a choice yet of do I need to invest on my cremation or funeral services that need to be done when death comes. Okay, what I would suggest there is, um, especially when you get later in years, everyone needs, there was a seminar I did two weeks ago at In Touch Ministry called Biblically Based Estate Planning. Everyone needs to do some biblically based estate planning and part of that is projecting the taxes and all the other costs on death. And because you don't want to leave your family with a net liability, right, and financial problems. So it's, your, your question is a comprehensive one. I, I can't answer in two minutes. It, it, uh, it took, that seminar was three hours. But basically, you, you gotta make sure that you do a projection and that there's enough there through life insurance or savings or whatever to look after the, all the expenses and provide something for your family members. A good man leaves an inheritance to the children's children, the proverb says. So I wanna right now, if you don't mind, I was gonna go into this section and then I'm gonna after this, open it up for questions, but I wanna make sure I get through this because some of the questions you're asking, 
Um, requires us to discern God's will through our relationship with Christ. Um, with respect to finances, God's word provides some clear laws. Do not covet your neighbor's ox or donkey. So if you're buying something because of covetousness, that is clearly outside of God's will. And then we're to love the Lord our God. In other words, we're to put God first in everything we do and get focused more on the Lord and things of eternal value as opposed to material things. As Paul said in Colossians 3, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. But there can be many principles, although there's many principles and guidelines that God gives, often he gives us biblical financial principles. There can be several choices within those uh, guidelines or those financial principles. Example, consider a spouse who have managed money according to God's principles, including using a budget, they have godly motives, and they are seeking God's specific direction with respect to the purchase of a house. Now in Psalms 32, 8, God said, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. One of God's promises is, he will direct us if we ask him to. But if, we, if you don't ask him to, if you don't spend time with the Lord in prayer, seeking his wisdom and direction, you're likely just going to, you're going to end up with second or third best as opposed to God's best. So, and that's what we want. We want God's best to discern God's will. Um, and here's some suggestion, because there's going to be some questions you ask where there's some that are clear. You know, someone's thinking of um, doing a certain thing and buying something they don't need. They're going to take it on with debt. To me, it's a no-brainer. You shouldn't be doing that. If it's not a necessity, God discourages debt, and God promised to meet our needs. You shouldn't buy that thing uh, because you don't need it, and you're going to get into debt. As a matter of fact, what you should do is focus on paying off your debt. You need a plan to eventually become debt-free. Um, but there's, there's, here's some suggestions, though. When you're, you're dealing with a question where you've got some biblical parameters or principles, and there's several choices in between them as to what to do. Buying the house is a good example. The couple gets approved for a $400,000 mortgage. Should they take on a $400,000 mortgage? Most people do. And they take their down payment to go buy the most expensive house they can. Maybe they should only take on a $250,000 mortgage and buy a house for $150,000 less. Should they get a four-bedroom house, a three-bedroom? Should they live in this neighborhood and that neighborhood? When a person goes to buy a car, should they get a used car or a new car? Uh, what kind of a car should, should they get? And, uh, you know, is it a $20,000 car? Is it a $40,000 car? Is it a good used car at $10,000? You need to discern God's will. Here's some suggestions to discern God's will for your life. In faith, pray and ask God for his wisdom and his direction. He's promised to give it to us. Pray and ask God to direct you through his word. In Psalms 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I'm sure some of you have experienced this. You read 100 verses in scripture, and then suddenly, boom, it's like one just jumps out at you. That's the, that's the Spirit of God. If you're born of the Spirit of God, that's the Spirit of God highlighting that Scripture to you and saying, hey, this is what I want you to do. I think of one couple, they weren't sure what to do, and that Proverbs 21.20 kept jumping out of them. The wise man saves for the future. They had been doing certain things, and they were certain, thinking of spending some things on some stuff they really didn't need, and they just realized God was telling them, save for the future. You need to save for the future. Another one says, in the house of the wise, there's a storage of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. And another, I remember one couple, that scripture really convicted them that said, hey, we need to have a cushion here. We need to have uh, some savings. Other ones, Proverbs 22, 7 or Deuteronomy 28 has convicted them to pay down debt when they went through it. So God, through his word, can really, um, uh, can really direct you. Confess and repent of any sin. You don't, sin acts as a roadblock. Isaiah 59 says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save or his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities, your sin has separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not listen. If there's a major sin in your life and you're trying to discern God's will, that sin's going to act as a roadblock. You don't want that. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You need to confess sin and turn away from it. You don't want it to affect your relationship with the Lord. In the financial area, sin can be any type of worldly attitude. Covetousness, selfishness, greed, pride, envy, lack of contentment. Those are all sins. They're worldly mindsets. They're worldly attitudes. You want to you wanna flee away from that. You also want to be still before the Lord. Psalms 37, 7 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. And ask God to speak to your heart and mind through his spirit. And when the God of the universe speaks to you, write it down as Habakkuk did in 2.2. Look for consistency in your spiritual journal. I really encourage Christians to have a spiritual journal. Many years ago, I, my wife's been journalizing, and had a spiritual journal for decades. And uh, about 10 years ago, and I, I used to think, you know, journaling was for girls. It wasn't for guys. But 
And it's amazing how God spoke to her. And, how, and, and I started doing it about 10 years ago. And I'm telling you, it can really help in your relationship with God. And also, as you write things down, I write down in blue my prayer requests. I write down in red what I think God is saying to me. If he gives me a scripture, I write that down in red. And then when you go back over it, often you'll see a consistency. And you can conclude from that, hey, the last three months, God's been telling me to do this. I better do it. It's easy to forget, you know. It's very easy. Be willing to do God's will, not your own will. That's what Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Obtain counsel from a godly advisor. And ask God to provide his direction through circumstances, as Gideon did with the fleece. But be careful. The availability of credit may not be the Lord opening a door for you to borrow money. It could be Satan opening a door to tempt you to get into debt. Because the enemy loves, he wants Christians in debt. He wants you to be a servant to lender. He wants you to be in arguments with your spouse over finances. He wants you to be stressed out so it distracts from your relationship with God. Um, so just be careful. Um, credit available may not be an open door from God, but often the way God can open doors is providing a really unique deal on something. Maybe you've been looking to replace your car and you've been praying for three or four months and suddenly, boom, a really good deal comes up. Number nine, ask God to provide his peace or lack of peace. That's a key one. If you're thinking about making some important financial decision, ask God to give you his peace or lack of peace. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. In other words, if you're about to do something, God will give you a peace about it. I'll also say this. If you don't have peace in the area of finances, the odds are you're not managing money God's way. You're probably violating some biblical principles, perhaps unknowingly, or maybe you're just doing something outside God's will. Number 10, develop a close personal relationship with the Lord so you can recognize God's voice and discern God's will clearly. In John 10, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. It, God may not speak to you audibly, although he can. He's never spoke to me audibly, but he spoke to people audibly in the, in, the, in the Bible. But he can speak to your heart. If the Spirit of God lives in you, he can speak to your heart, he can speak to your mind, and he can give you a peace or lack of peace. He can speak through, your, through his word. He can direct you. God is very able to direct you. Isaiah 48, 17 is a fantastic verse. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you and who directs you in the way you should go. So that's the key. This is for those that, that have accepted Christ as their Savior and Lord. They have a personal relationship with Christ. Here's some suggestions on how, you, through your relationship with Christ, you can discern God's will, which is God's best. There's, uh, there's 10 suggestions. If you do not have a personal relationship with God, God's word, the Bible, is clear. It directs you as follows. God loves you, and he wants you to have a personal relationship with him. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. That knowing he's talking about is a close personal relationship. However, unfortunately, our sin has separated us from God. As Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I know before I became a Christian, I used to always think, well, maybe there is a God, maybe there isn't, maybe there's a heaven, maybe there's a hell, but I figured if there's a heaven, I'd make the cut, you know, that I was good enough. And that's, that's what a lot of people think. If you talk to most people, I get to my accounting practice, I, I, most of my clients at least half are non-believers. I get to share and witness to them. And often, most of them, they're, they're good people, they're hardworking people, but often they're, they're, uh, they think, well, if there's a heaven and a hell, I'll be in heaven uh, because I'm, I'm good enough. Yet the scripture is clear that all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. Why? Because the only way you can earn your way to heaven is by living a holy and perfect life like Christ did. And of course, none of us are holy, none of us are, are perfect. So as the diagram represents, sin has separated us, results in separation from God. Um, many people seek God the wrong way, good works, religion, philosophy, morality. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And here the Bible is talking about spiritual death, that separation from God for eternity. So these things, it doesn't matter how much you do good works, it doesn't matter how religious you are, or how often you go to church, it doesn't matter your philosophy. For me it was morality. I thought if a person was a good person, they would just automatically go to heaven. That's not what scripture says. And actually, God has provided the only solution, and it's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's the key. Jesus Christ has provided the only solution to have a personal relationship with God and spend eternity in heaven. We have to believe in our heart and mind that he died on the cross and paid the penalty for our sins. And in a minute, I'm going to actually... Uh, I'm going to encourage those who haven't done this um, to, to consider this. Are you willing? Admit you've sinned. I mean, we've, we've all sinned. 
Be willing to turn your sins, turn from your sins and obey God. Believe that Christ died for your sins. Accept him as your savior. That well-known verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And number four, in prayer, invite Christ to come in and control your life through the spirit. That is, accept him as your Lord. Jesus said, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. What Christ is saying is that's the spirit of God. And I'm just going through some scriptures here. And if you're feeling the spirit of God knocking at the door of your heart, that's not me. That's the spirit of God that's knocking at the door. And, and God doesn't force his way in. He, he, he knocks at the door and then we have to open the door of our heart and our life and to turn it over with him. And if we do that, We'll, we'll enjoy fellowship with him and enjoy his very best because we'll get his direction. I'm going to lead in this prayer in a minute. First, I'm going to read it. Then I'm going to lead in the prayer. Um, and here's what it's going to be. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Christ died for my sins. I'm willing to turn from my sins. I now invite Christ to come into my heart and life as my personal Savior. I am willing by God's strength to follow and obey Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. I'm not going to ask anybody to go fo come forward or raise their hand. But I am going in just about 30 seconds leading this prayer, and I'm going to ask everybody to bow their head. And if, if you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior and your Lord, if you haven't made this kind of commitment before, I would really encourage you to do it silently between you and God. God knows our hearts. He sees each one of our hearts. He's, he, he knows it. And I'd encourage you to make this kind of commitment. So let's pray. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I am willing to turn from my sins. I now invite Christ to come into my heart and life as my personal Savior. And I am willing by God's strength to follow and obey Jesus as the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, here are two of God's great promises. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, God gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent or born of a human decision, but born of God. And if you've accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, then you're a child of God. You have the privilege of enjoying a personal relationship with the Lord. And if, um, if you prayed that prayer today for the first time, there's some of these uh, things on the uh, resource table as you go out. They're called All Things Are New. It's by In Touch Ministries. I'd encourage you to pick one of those up. And also, if you prayed that prayer for the first I I would love to hear from you. Uh, tell me or, or send an email. Or speak to um, uh, Pastor Dave. Uh, where's Pastor Dave? He's at the back there. You know who he is. Speak to him or one of his leaders. And uh, we'd just like to help you um, further in your, your growth uh, as, as, a, as a Christian. So I'm now going to go back to um, what we were on before, switch back over to the, uh, the, the financial side, and uh, just dealing with some, um, some follow-up. Actually, I, I did forget. Uh, here's the key verses. Uh, and I will leave some time at the end for some questions. But um, recommended verses, be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. Can you do that? Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. I went through it too quickly, didn't I? How about this one? The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. I'll, I'll say that one again. The plans of the diligent lead to profit. Let's just remember that sign. The plans of the diligent lead to profit. Can we do that? The plans of the diligent lead to profit. Yeah, excellent. The idea of profit there is not profit for selfish, but some versions use the plans of the diligent lead to advantage. The idea is if you plan diligently, especially if you do it in conjunction with discerning God's will, uh, God's going to bless you. Let's do this other one because this is an important one. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. I'll say it again. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. Let's try it. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. Excellent. You don't have herds and flocks probably. Actually, are there any farmers here? Probably not. But remember at that time, most people were farmers. So to know the condition of their herds and their flocks meant they need to know where they were at in terms of financially. Where are you at financially? How much debt do you have? Where's your money going? That's so important. You need to track your expenses. Are you paying down debt? Are you saving enough for future needs? Your car's five years old. You know you're going to have to replace it in another five years. Have, have you got a plan to save so you can pay cash for the next car, um, even if it's a used car? Have you got some sort of a plan so you don't consistently have, uh, have debt to, to pay for cars so you can get rid of that, that car loan payment? 
So the last thing, and I will have it open for questions at the end, just, but I just want to go through the follow-up. Um, follow-up, develop and implement your own budget. If you're married, include your spouse. A free copy of the Copeland Budgeting System can be downloaded from biblefinance.org. And there's a 30-minute video there on the website. It's free. Uh, be sure to, to watch that. It goes into more detail than what, what I've done today. Uh, there's something called Tom's Top Financial Moments. Um, it's a one CD set. These are free. Uh, I would encourage you to pick one up, listen to it while uh, you're driving in the car. It contains 70 of my, uh, I've written, I've done about 175 financial moments, and uh, these are absolutely free. Now, some of the other materials, like the CDs and DVDs, Debt Reduction God's Way, uh, we have to charge for some of those just because it costs a lot of money to put it together and try to recover the costs. And there's my book, Financial Management God's Way. Um, that There's a leader's guide and participant's copy. Uh, I would encourage you to get a copy of that. And that's, that's a very comprehensive study of what the Bible says on finances. And that's even available on our website in terms of an interactive video. Uh, the, about the first nine, I think about the first seven sessions out of the, the 12 are up there. So um, you can even access uh, that as well. And by the way, I have a policy. If you need the CD series, Debt Reduction God's Way, it's, by the way, it covers a lot more than what we're covering here. This is about three and a half hours, say three hours of, of presentation. That Debt Reduction God's Way is six two-hour sessions. It goes into a lot more detail about how to get out of debt. And, so, and if you're hurting financially and you need those CDs or the DVDs, Debt Reduction God's Way, you can't afford to pay it, just tell Tony that and you can have it. We'll give it to you for free. Um, if you can pay, that would be appreciated too. It all goes to the ministry. I don't get anything. I spend about 1,500 hours a year in this. I don't get a dime. Uh, this is all for the Lord's work. Financial coaching. Sometimes some, some of you need, may need some financial coaching for your specific situation. Um, if you're interested in that, then complete the uh, tear-off at the back here and uh, put it on the resource table uh, desk there, and uh, we'll assign a financial coach. I, the Lord's given me about 30 financial coaches that I've trained. They've gone through financial management God's way, at least most of them a couple of times. They've been through a number of workshops here, and uh, they have a good understanding of God's word on finances. They coach the person. We do get you to do some homework. Uh, I'll put some numbers in on the Copeland budgeting system, and then they'll coach you, and then they come to me with any problems that uh, they can't solve. By working through these people, we can help a couple hundred people a year. If I was doing it all myself personally, I could probably only coach maybe 15 or 20. So, um, and that, by the way, that's done on a ministry basis uh, for free. So, um, at, at, at no charge. But there is some homework. You've got to complete uh, part of the Copeland budgeting system. Um, watch the number of you said you've seen the financial moments. I would like to get, just get an input. Uh, who's heard the financial moments? I'm going to go through each one, each um, Life 100.3 WDCX. First of all, who's heard the financial moments on WDCX? Okay, that's many people. How about Life 100.3? Okay, that's quite a few. That's based in Barrie, great station, but it only comes down about as far as Taunton Road. How many have uh, seen the financial moments on CTS TV? Okay. And what about Vision TV? Okay. Great. That's, uh, it, 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 you know, one of the things I always wonder, we put them on those stations, are people actually seeing it? Now, the TV station tells you all kinds of people are seeing it and hearing it. So does the, uh, but it's always, uh, at least it gives me an idea. There's a good uh, broad section here. Uh, another thing is, um, the, uh, as the Lord leads, we could use some volunteers for uh, this ministry. Now, with financial coaching, we're in pretty good shape on that. But if you feel you'd like to be a financial coach, talk to me about it. Technology assistance. Henry's my tech guy, and he does a great job. But there's actually more than what we can handle. We'd like to produce an app. If you know anything about that and you'd like to do it on a ministry basis, see us. Video editing. We need help with that. We produce a lot more videos than Henry can, uh, can edit. He, he edits videos and does a great job, but it, it, it takes time, and he can't do them all and increasing the, the ministry through our website and social media. So if you feel led in any way that respect, just uh, talk to me or, or Henry afterwards. Um, if the, guard, the Lord leads you, feel free to, to give to the ministry because uh, it costs money to be on radio and TV. Uh, but the Lord is, is blessing it. Uh, and sometimes people uh, spy. Actually, we're on Calgary Shine radio station, um, which covers one and a half million people. That's the coverage probably... 30,000 people are listening to it every day, and that was mainly just because a businessman out there um, decided to sponsor it. So, um, um, again, I don't get anything out of it. Actually, I, I donate a very significant amount of money to the charity, but uh, 
these things cost money, but it's God's calling for me. I've, I've, God's told me this in the last 10 years to teach his word on finances. I, before I always did it at my local church, but he wanted me to take it beyond that and do it to the nation of Canada. And God's making that happen with 62 radio stations across this country. And I praise his name because I have no background in radio or TV. I'm an accountant by profession. Um, but I have been teaching God's word on this since 82. So uh, that was the Lord that opened those doors.